Good evening to you all. Thank you very much for coming out tonight to um, the beautiful Athenaeum Centre. Um, I am Jennifer Byrne. He is He's not David Jennifer. Walsh. Um, he is the... He's a professional gambler. He is um, the founder, funder, and creator of Mona. And you all know him because that's why he's here. And if I was being really formal, David, I would say you are David Walsh AO because you are now an officer of the Order of Australia. Did they ring first to ask you if it was okay? They didn't ring, they sent you a letter. And what did they say? It said, would you like to be an AO when you grow up? <laughs> And I said, can I have it now? Because, you know, I'm a bit worried that I'll ever get to that stage. But initially, I was going to turn it down, and I wrote a blog about this. Did anyone read my blog? No. Oh, God. I'm, I'm, I'm God, really hoping... yourself. I'm really hoping... I can't see anything. This is annoying. I really hope no one read my book, because they're the only yarns I've got. When they contacted me, I didn't know that there were grades of AO... So, I was going to knock it back, and then I found out... Well, on that the I, grounds of just... On the grounds of it being... I, you know, I didn't realise that I could show people up with it. Other, AO, uh, other A's that didn't O. So, um, but then I found out a local Tasmanian tourism promoter, who's really up himself, had also got an order of Australia, but his was a member of the Order of Australia, and it turns out an officer of the Order of Australia is further up, you know, in the, in the British domain, it's call me God and God calls me God. So, so I'm God calls me God and he isn't. So I thought it'd, you know, because he's so up himself, I thought it'd be a right royal gesture <laughs> to stick it up him properly. So that's why I took it. Well, it's commendable. Um, though I did, I did read your blog, and um, it does have one of the really good lines that, um, yes, you are an officer, but... Yes, but I'm not a gentleman yet. <laughs> Nor do I have any intention of being so. In fact, my initial interpretation was that AO stood for adults only, and gentlemen typically can be screened. <laughs> <laughs> the only one that laughed at that. Is I that because you're getting paid? Well, it's because I can't hear you very well, so ah. it sounded awfully funny. <laughs> <laughs> My listen. jokes best, uh, best remain unheard. Um, now, the subject tonight is the origin of art, which um, is, is the, also the name of one of the, um, of an exhibition you've got on later this year at Mona, but we'll come to that later. What I wanted to um, ask you is why were you drawn to the subject of the origin of art? I mean, it's, it's implicit in, you know, what's art for? Why do humans make art? Why do humans respond to art? Why was that important to you to explore? The answer to that is, in one word, in my opinion, and it's pretty well always been my opinion since I stopped being a god botherer, is biology. It has been my experience that most of the shows I've attended and that... Re and since I became interested in speculating on what art is, that's been a lot, that everyone sees art as culture. And they therefore see artists as cultural machines. And of course they are cultural machines, but they're cultural machines that are somewhat mediated by biology, instincts, by selection in the ancestral environment. It is the point of the exhibition to be an act of advocacy for the position that art and other cultural phenomena are mediated by biology. I've used that word twice already. I wonder how many times I get out tonight. Although, although I can't really see, I really want to know how many of you... Are there people up there? Yes. No. How do you know who I was talking to? Oh, you can see me, of course. <laughs> I've got a six-month-old child who, when you do that, doesn't know that if he can't see, you can possibly still see. So I'm in that domain at the moment. The You're regressing, David. You're regressing to father. That's, in my case, that's progressing. <laughs> I want to know how many people believe that evolution still acts on cultural phenomena. 
Put your bloody iron. Oh, does that mean no one at all? I expected to be preaching to the converted. Oh, there's a few. Thank okay. you. Yeah, I can see. And the is there line. anyone that believes that evolution is a pile of crap? No one's offering. And are there any? One would hope. How many Aboriginal people are there amongst us? You see how culturally warped we are. It's reason, Saturday, it's, it's a Wednesday night in Melbourne. The re, what does that mean? Well, they've come out to hear you talk. Well, I mean, they're not sort of culturally selecting or racially selecting. Well, they obviously are because it's, you know... It's, Why do you want to know? Anyway, what, what well, the reason I wanted to know, you know, is because before we were having a discussion about whether we should celebrate the traditional owners of the land and we decided not to because my principle was that that's disingenuous and if we care, we should give them back their land because it's fucking theirs. And this, just to take you all within the, what we were talking about was because we were talking about whether we should do the traditional welcome to country. And that was how that conversation... Acknowledgement, acknowledgement. acknowledgement to country. Thank you, pardon. Did I say welcome? Sorry. Or did you... It's my fault, okay. Um, and you were the true believers too. Damn. <laughs> and David had a view on the traditional nature of that. So, what, I don't understand the nature of acknowledgement. I, that's but, which is why I couldn't remember the term. But what we were talking about is <laughs> that, that you think that... We've got plenty of time. Biology, that biology, which is, uh, you know, which is the subject that four different people that you've recruited to contribute to this exhibition will be um, writing about, that biology is the driver of art. And I think for many of us, that's a quite an alien and new idea because most of us, I think if we thought about it at all, it's something that humans always did. We know about the cave painting and this was something that was seen as, um, as just an ancient practice. But what you're saying is that we are hardwired. And my question is, you obviously care about this deeply. In fact, you said that one of the reasons you created Mona was to discuss this very subject. Why is it so important? Okay, so when I was opening Mona, a bunch of journalists asked me what I was trying to achieve and I said Mona is about sex and death. But I didn't mean that the pictures on the wall were going to be picked people fucking and killing or whatever, which would have been a much better slogan had I thought of it. I meant, <laughs> I meant that I was looking across all domains, across all cultures, across all creative endeavours from Egyptian sarcophagi to occasionally ballet in the festivals and, and seeing a commonality. What generates that commonality? Why do we call it art? They don't look alike. Does music come from the same domain as tap dancing, as sculpture, and in particular, you know, the big shift in art in the 20th century, is it, is it the same thing? So long before Mona Arp opened, about 15 years ago, I started writing a book. And it was a terrible book. And fortunately, the computer that had the only copy of it long ago blew up. Otherwise, someone would one day release a bit of it, but which was all there was. It was crap. And then the writing was also crap. So it was essentially uh, shit with a turd sauce. So there was just nothing worth reading about it. But anyway... I think you've guaranteed a very keen line at the end to buy your book. <laughs> the... And a better book. This I'm is a sure different book. a better book. It's a different Much book. Better. It's a better book. That doesn't mean it's a good book, believe me. The nature of the book was the theory of sexual selection. Darwin was at least a proselytizer of it, and I think the originator of it. And for those that subscribe to it, the theory hasn't shifted that much, and that is that there is natural selection, which is essentially traits being selected for, on the basis of competition, so better eyesight leads to a bunch of things that might lead to better t nutrition or better identification of potential partners, a whole bunch of things, better eyesight might be selected for. And incidentally, that might well put me out of the game straight away in our ancestral environment, but natural selection 
was one of the mechanisms he described for evolution and the other one was called sexual selection. Sexual selection is essentially what we understand male peacocks to be doing when they have this enormous, costly, heavy decoration that can... beautiful plumage, as Monty Python described it. We can... We can see it. Their potential mates can see it. They are running a female chooser... Mo uh, sorry, a male chooser model. Female choosing. A female, yeah, female... Male offering, the, female choosing. Thank you for having a vague idea what you're talking about, unlike me. A female chooser model, so the females don't waste all this energy developing what's called a fitness marker. And a fitness marker is a biological identification of a capacity to waste, like a, like a red Ferrari, perhaps. Um, or an art gallery. That is, that is literally the same thing. Or, or a what? An art gallery. Or, or, no, well, that's exactly... I, my art gallery is built below ground, perhaps solely so I can say, come downstairs and see my etchings. <laughs> the... You're a desperate man, David. Oh. <laughs> I'm a married man. And I forgot my ring. Okay. My wife's out there. I have to tell her this because later she's going to notice and be very grumpy. But I forgot my ring. ring. It was, an, of course, we, you know, quite capable of self-delusion and... And, you know, in fact, it's a fundamental biological principle that we have to lie to ourselves. I hope you ask me a question about that later, because I'd like to talk about it. But, um, so sexual selection was the other mechanism that Darwin described for, for invoking evolution. A proponent of Darwin's theory and an updater of it is a, an American various biologist... I don't know exactly what he is, called Jeffrey Miller, who wrote a book called The Mating Mind in 2000 that had a big impact on me. But at the time that I started writing this earlier book, I hadn't read it. What I had heard about was a phenomenon called stotting, which the wildlife programs love to, love to air, and it's basically gazelles and some other animals jumping up and down in the face of predators. In particular, they usually show Thompson gazelles because they can jump really high when they're being confronted by lion predators or even occasionally cheetahs. And they don't start doing it until the predator was within about 40 metres. So superficially, it might be very risky behaviour. I thought the reason they were doing it... Now, the point of sexual selection of biology in general is to get genes into the next generation using any mechanism. It's not about longevity for the individual. In fact, it's not even about the individual. It may be about the traits that are reflected in the genes, but basically, from a gene's eye point of view, it is the gene trying to get into the next generation. And there are a huge number of mechanisms to do that, including, for example, being a good allo parenter, a supporter of other bearers of your genes, such as, and this is actually perfectly alloparenting because alloparents can be unrelated, but grandfathers, grandmothers, siblings can all enhance the survivability of their own genes by looking after their respective ne ne nephews, nieces, grandchildren, whatever, because they share quite a lot of genes. So kin genes get into the next generation through kin, but that isn't where I was going with starting. So there you go. Um, they're jumping up and down. The predator's there. I thought that the, it might well, it most logically would reduce their life expectancy. But in the event that they did survive, the lady gazelles would go, Cor, did you see what he did? He's kind of hot. And so it would reduce their life expectancy, but enhance their reproduction. It's a good theory. It turned out to be complete crap. Starting... Well, it, I mean, the jumping is the same as the, as the peacock tail, isn't it? Which is sort of drags it behind. It isn't. Well, it drags, it pulls back. It's an apparent... 
yeah, anti-survival but... mechanism, but what you're saying is if you do survive, you pass on your genes more reliably. The peacock feathers is a genuine example of it. You waste energy, but it attracts mates. Mate selection wants the biggest display, the best display, the, you know, the widest range of pattern, patternation. So there's signaling and response to signal that causes runaway selection. That's what I thought stotting was. It turned out that stotting is, in fact, what's called honest signaling. The gazelles that do it are very fit. They can jump up and down. The lions say, these guys are very fit. I'll target someone else. And, in fact, their life, ex their life expectancy is enhanced. So you can't conclude that they're also more likely over a unit time to be sexually... Se able to, you know, more, more sexually attractive because they don't need to be because through that period they live longer. And to the argument that some might put in the 21st century, particularly women, that this notion that men are the custodians and show off, show off people and that women are sitting there selecting but not that there is a fundamental biological nature difference between the sexes. That's what you are arguing in this. Well... I don't... Do you think that's a real, really helpful it's, Well, firstly, sex was invented by biology as a useful strategy. It, it's, it, it enables one to engage more phenotypes. It enables you to out evolve parasites. But there isn't just one sexual selection strategy. There's the one that we were just talking about. I didn't know this when I started writing the book, so it's a bloody good thing it didn't come out. Cause... But some species, most species, that engage in sex use... Are there any evolutionary biologists out there? I really hope there aren't. And, it's and you'll get your turn to ask questions. It's a good thing I can't see a show of hands. So one strategy is essentially the carer of young, the largest investor in the caring of young, and it seems obvious why they would be more choosy than... The, the carers would be more choosy than those that are just trying to have as many offspring as possible... And in humans, that's... Are you saying that the, the carer stays at home and the, and the male uh, is out there showing off to yeah. get maximum penetration? Yeah, well, I mean, if it, it is probably not true for humans. Humans probably use... Because, you know, I've got a baby, I hang around, that's called mutual mate choice. Each partner is choosing the other. Men are, are in, in humans... Statistically, arguably, you know, people might argue that this is an aspect of culture that's changing. The biological propensity is for men to be willing to choose more one-night stands but be just as choosy as women when they're choosing potential partners, right? So there are multiple strategies for getting into the next generation. One of them is to shag as much as you can. That doesn't work for women because they have to look after the kids. They're born with, with all the, the uh, uh, you know, all the over there, well, not all of them, but the vast majority of the over they're ever going to have. And they spend nine months pregnant each time they do it. There's a lot of effort in a woman having a children, in children, not so much in men. But at the level of most selection in humans, there is mutual mate and choice. Okay, so... I think that we probably all have our view about that, and as you have well, said let's, let's before... I'll, I'll talk to each of you later. <laughs> we're why we're does, having dinner at Super Normal, you're all invited. <laughs> why does... Why is... You're arguing, as I understand it, that art is one of the selection mechanisms, that, the, that, that it is hardwired into us. Why is that so important to you? It isn't. To argue, well, it is because you, you're the one who's actually mounting this entire exhibition. You've brought four really senior. This will happen later this year. Really senior evolutionary biologists and psychologists and, and liter literature professors to argue different forms of why evolution 
may or may not be, be absolutely fundamental in art. So it obviously is important to you. And why is it important that art stand on science? I just like evolution. So I... You weren't even listening to that question, weren't you? <laughs> not even Why listening. is it important that I've got four smart people? To, well, you know, I'm, I've got a bunch of smart people to listen to me. That's, is, that is about... That, there is a biological propensity to seek status as well. And we have all sorts of ways of doing it, including doing this. This, the idea of doing this, you know, certainly years ago and even now makes me quake in my boots. Why would I do something that I don't enjoy doing? What, what's, the, what's the mechanism? Am I just a blank slate who can say, well, I'd rather not turn up, so I won't turn up. In fact, there are a whole bunch of ways of contriving to get humans to do things because we have built into us, by biology, things called cognitive biases. Cognitive biases exist for two reasons. One is to bind us more fully, but the key one is to, in biology, in, in our ancestral environment, for which most of our characteristics evolved, because we spent a long time, a lot more time in the savannah in Africa than we have out of the savannah in Africa, so we're quite well adapted to that, that's why you know, paleo diet, people think that that's going to work because they're essentially accepting this whole background as, as given. They're not necessarily exploring it fully, but... So it, it's, it's, it's taken that our biological nature appeared in our ancestral environment. So an adaption now isn't necessarily... Sorry, an adaption then isn't necessarily useful now. Stephen Pinker... There are, there are two ways that adaption occurs. One is by being useful, and the other one is by... It's called an... Oh, basically, it's called a side effect and a bunch of other foolish biological names. It piggybacks on an adaption. So the example that Stephen Pinker is one of the four wise men, and I'm sure she's going to criticise the wise men in a moment, but one of the four wise men that we have hired essentially scientists to be curators of our ex exhibition, each of them to argue, using art and also by writing an essay, their own particular theory about why biology matters in art. Essentially, it's arguable that biology matters in anything. Of the four, two of them argue that art is not of itself adapt. They all say it's biological. That's the nature of the exhibition, and I think most people certainly most scientists that are past the point of believing in the, what used to be called the, the blank slate model, that we are different than animals in that we just accrue the capacity for being human after we're born, that we're not a bunch of instincts, cognitive biases, as I mentioned before. In fact, it is my opinion, that, and, and that of most I think evolutionary biologists, certainly the ones that we've contacted about this exhibition, that, and, and yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, <laughs> that we are only quantitatively different from animals, not qualitatively. That there are a few dimensional parameters, like we might have more developed speech or something. Is that adaptive? Some argue that it is, Stephen Pinker, one of the participants. Some people think that even that isn't adaptive. And I'm going to talk about now an argument from Mark Changizi that I think is really beautiful, but it's taken quite some time to wrap my head about around it. Language has all the things that make it look adaptive. It's easy to learn. Virtually everyone acquires it. It does... Oh, to, to have David, a genetic... Might, I'm I'm gonna, yes, good idea. Interrupt me. I am going to interrupt you. I'll tell you why, because this is a fascinating exhibition. I mean, I've been reading about it. It is tremendous. It's kind of hard to come at cold. Um, and I guess that's why um, I would say, you know, there are these four eminent people who have all contributed in different ways. What I would like to talk about, ask you to talk about, is why you, who for most of us, are deeply associated with art. Why this is important to you? Because you've said to me that this was actually one of the reasons 
you created, Mona, because you wanted this to be discussed in the general community. Why is it important to you? This might seem a glib answer, but there is no doubt that I was and probably still am an undiagnosed autistic person, or at least what we now call a nerd. In our <laughs> ancestral environment, we hung around in groups of 50 called bands, or maybe 100, at most 150, because to organise more than 150 you need people, you need hierarchies, and that might be a contributor to the usefulness of language, actually, because you, can, you can't have effective hierarchies without more prominent forms of communication than, than the greater apes have. But, yeah, when I was a kid, I was the sort of kid that got obsessed, and I got obsessed by two things, evolutionary biology and astronomy, and it's... So far, I haven't figured out a way of doing an astronomy exhibition in an art gallery. But you will. But you I will. will. You will. I don't so, doubt it. Yeah. And anyway, like, the, the, the evolution drove the gallery because, you know, why do people do things? Why, why do artists... Why are artists compelled to give the signals that they do? Or, and more so, why do most humans at some level consume them? There's the elite art, you know, that Mona might represent... But there's also what is occasionally called folk art, but I don't really like the term. Everybody makes art. Every, everybody that has a voice sings badly in the shower. Everybody draws in the sand, makes sandcastles when they're at the beach. Everyone dances around when they've had a few drinks. We all participate, and when we do it badly, when we're dancing in a bar, we are signalling. Art is not just about creativity, it's about consumption of creativity. Those things suggest a biological background. The universality of art suggests a biological background. We, we, all, we all do it and all societies do it. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be cheap psychoanalyzing here, but, but what you're saying is this way you can belong? This is your belonging? No, I'm just, I'm a mad obsessive. <laughs> and I got interested in art. These are potentially, possibly two unrelated things. And I should say that it's, a really difficult thing to understand what your own motives are. Because, and again, I'll invoke biology, we are designed to deceive. In fact, children that tell lies, however you measure intelligence through G or IQ, are more like, the more lies they tell, the higher their IQ, the better they're going to be at IQ tests, whatever that means, in adulthood. De the way to efficiently deceive someone is not to be a good liar, it's to deceive yourself. We are machines that are, our, even our visual system is, the cones in our eyes that enable us to see in the, da in the daytime are tuned to the frequency, there are three frequencies that they respond to, the free optimum, Dave. Let me finish. I want to stay with you. Three optimal frequencies. Those ones are not broad across the visible light. They are the ones that enable us to see blood under the skin. When we lie consciously, it takes a huge cognitive effort. Try to tell someone you love them when you don't, and you'll realise, unless you're a sociopath, it's bloody hard to do. <laughs> It should be bloody hard to do. So, that's just an example. Oh, incidentally, darling, I love you. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to say that if I didn't. And your, and your cheek colour has not Where changed. Are we? Yes, uh, yes, have a look at me. Can you, and now I'm me? checking. I'm checking. So, I, wonder, know, okay, we, I want to ask... We are red with rage, green with envy. They reflect our perception systems because we're good at red, we're good at green, blue. We are designed to recognise falsehoods in others. Therefore... The best way to tell a falsehood is to believe it ourselves. Do you really believe that, scientific, that science can explain pretty much everything? No. Can? Yes. Has? No. I've heard about religion, you know, that it's useful for the gaps. The God of the gaps, they call it. The things we don't know. Let's, let's give that to God. I actually don't think... Science isn't about explaining things. It's about eliminating things from contention. It is about doubt. 
Right, okay. I want to ask you a personal question. It was just, you have this passionate faith in evolution um, and belief, belief, not a faith, a belief. Um, and in your book, Bone of Fact, you talk about your mother, right? And you talk about um, that the best, you know, she, the, the, the most she hoped for for you was that you'd become a public servant maybe or a teacher because I think you use a phrase like, um, I put my notes in a way. She could cast her mental net no wider. Exactly right. I wrote the book. (laughs) Indeed you did, David. Um, How, with your faith in evolution, and I think then we should leave evolution probably, but how, with your faith in evolution, do you explain that from that background of a very narrow net you has come someone with, with, with a brain rivaling a planet. In fact, you might be the Pluto replacement. A very, uh, a very small planet. And, it, you know, it might have high geomagnetism, but magnetism can be repulsive as well. What? Did you guys understand? <laughs> so... Um, You know, how do you go from believing to not believing? Well, people make transitions. I I guess to begin with, it was an act of faith in in, in the sense that, you know, believers... I don't believe that not believing is a a form of belief. I actually think that someone said, but I've not been able to find the quote, so it might have been me, that not believing in God, calling not believing in God a faith is like calling not playing chess a hobby. But that's not what I was asking. Is well, that I was a, ask, oh, how could I answer how, the question? How I did you to come hear? out of that? How did you come out of that? Oh, you know, I, look, I was a child that sat in the corner a bit, didn't have any friends. You know, so I had nothing else to do. I also had asthma all the time. So when I, while other kids were at school, I was at home trying to learn everything. You know, as I say, nerds were useful in our ancestral environment because you needed someone in your small population that didn't express the cognitive biases as much as others because mm. sometimes a food supply dies and the best strategy is to take a risk and move somewhere else. That's and what if- nerds are for. It's... You know, when you see people like the Facebook guy, what's his name? Mark Zuckerberg. Thank you. When you see people like Zuckerberg, you know, and if, being in demand, you just realise it. And if what the time it, for nerds has come again. <laughs> and what would... Do you ever think what you're... I mean, you said that, that you would be a di- autistic or borderline or whatever. I mean... If you had been diagnosed, if you'd been assigned, aha, so you're on the spectrum, do you ever think how different your life would have been if you were given a name? I could be glib and say they might have cured me. But, um, you know, these days there's a movement, and I'm in dangerous territory here, that just sees autism as part of the normal aspect of, of development, you know, on the spectrum of normal development. And so autistic people are described as something like non-neurotypical. Along with, there are some autistic people that although they can't see the forest for the trees, are very bloody good at seeing the trees. Mm. And, you know, occasionally that seems useful. Occasionally it's adaptive but quite often it's a significant disorder. I get letters from people all the time. And what do they say? That say, you know, you've given me hope, my son, particularly son, because it's weighted against, you know, it's more expressed in males. You know, he sits in the corner and I think, well... And do you write back? What's that? Do you write back? I always write back and I say, if, if help is available, seek help. It's most likely to be... A disorder, and yeah, I'm I'm not one of just because he can get. Uh, Kisha, my wife, still uses it all the time as a justification for what she thinks is my weird behaviour. You know, 
For example, my willingness to talk to hundreds of strangers at once. For example, which, your determination to walk through the theatre, even though we were saying, don't was, go, I was, David. I was demonstrating a point that, you know, with, without the agenda that the crowd, each individual in the crowd presumably presented for, without that context, we could just walk around and very few people would recognise us. It was true. Yeah. And so if... Even though we were wearing the microphone. <laughs> One of the, um, but one of the great gifts you have had is this mathematical super um, calculation. Is gambling, which of course, as we all know, is how Mona was funded, is funded, um, is it still fun for you? The scheming is fun. Gambling, there's a certain pure, look, I'm going to maintain the hypocritical position of Exploiting you if you gamble, but I recommend that you don't. <laughs> you know, and the gambling is a pure problem. Particularly when you bet with a tab, they take their cut out and they give the rest of the money back divided according to who won the race, right? Most of my betting is on horse racing these days. Casinos don't love me anymore. So... Uh, fact, are you allowed into any casinos now? Yeah, they let me in. They say... Hello, Mr. Walsh. Nice to see you. And, yeah, I mean, the skills that were useful then I don't possess anymore. You know, there's a new generation of, of smart kids that are cutting casinos nuts off, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know how they do it. The world moves on. But the thing but I do... But you're an old school gambler. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm like someone that doesn't plug their instrument in. <laughs> the... <laughs> Is it fun? Is it still fun for it's, you? It's, when it's, so let me get back to where I was. The, the TAB, they take a bit, out of, a bit of money out, they give it to the winner. So you can effectively see it as a very pure economic problem. It is. There's a thing called the efficient market hypothesis, which came from a guy called Eugene Famer, probably in the 50s, that, said, that says that all the information in a market will be reflected in the price, which essentially says you can't win. It turns out not to be the case, but it's bloody hard. And the problem, the, the exploration of the problem is, is really exciting. Once you've got and tested the system, you've already won. The actual betting is of no interest whatsoever anymore. Is there a secret you could just sp spread around the people in this room? And we wouldn't tell. Well, I can have a crack at summarising how you win. Mm. There are three components. And I'll start with the analogy of rolling a die. There are, it's a fair die. There are six sides to it. So, each number is independent of the other. Only one of them can come up at a time. That's obvious. So... There is one chance in six of each of those numbers coming up on the next roll. You cannot have any foreknowledge of what number's coming up. You know, the universe has rules. As far as we know, it precludes knowledge of the future. What you can know, and I believe that chance is a real phenomenon, it is not lack of knowledge. There are, the universe isn't determined. It isn't inevitable what will happen, but we just don't know it. The omniscience, the all, the all knowledge attributed to God, is not available in this universe. I believe that. When you roll a die, there is one chance in six of any side coming up, as I said before. But when you bet, you don't necessarily get $6 back when you win. Let's say you got $100 back if you bet on number one because the market was foolish. In the long run, you would win. If you got $2 back every time you wagered on a one and six proposition, you would lose. Betting on things that are more likely to happen than their odds suggest, is that clear? Is that clear? Good. Betting on things that are more likely to happen than their odds suggest 
in the long run makes you a winner. That there are three components to the problem of gambling, and evolution faces this too. Evolution is not directed, it is a blind watchmaker, as Dawkins described it. We want the three. What are the three? The three are, <laughs> in both in, the three are knowing what the chance of the event is, knowing what the payout is, and given the two circumstances of knowing how much money you've got, your bankroll, and knowing how much money you, how much you'll change the payout if you do, how big to bet. So to reiterate, the three things are, how often is it going to happen? How much is it going to pay? That's got to be bigger than how often it's going to happen or you don't bet. But if it is, then the third problem is how much to bet. And you might not, not know it, but in your life, you have, you have a built-in algorithm for doing this. It's part of our biological nature. Uh, sort of an approximation thing. Every time you buy a house, you employ this algorithm. Is it worth 500000 I hope so, because I'm paying 500000 for it. You think you're getting value. The difference is the quality of the transaction is spread over statistical space. It's spread over a lot of events instead of just one, but it's exactly the same. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, in, in mathematics it's called statistical arbitrage. I'm taking a whole bunch of events, compressing them, making them essentially one event and working out whether I'm getting good odds for it. And armed with that knowledge, you can immediately go out and make nothing whatsoever. <laughs> because it I'm not really going to give my secrets away. <laughs> took a long time to get that. Um, do you do it every day? I think about it every day. It's, it must be like ladies or mastermind, I don't know. It's, um, yeah, I, how, how often do men think about sex? About 14 times an hour, some say. Well, I think I think about gambling more than that. But I don't actually place bets anymore. That's done by... And also, most of the strategies we use now were developed by much smarter people that, unfortunately, for their sake, got to the game late. So I get... It's what Marx calls exploitation of labour, and I do it. And it works in gambling as it does in other endeavour. It may be morally objectionable. I haven't worked that out yet. It's very hard to figure out if something you gain from personally is OK. When you've got skin in the game, you can never be the arbiter of... But isn't, of m appropriate morality. But isn't the reality that, that really no one anymore, I mean, I don't know, but I think no one anymore judges you as a, as a gambler because you have put that money into something which is a beautiful thing. And so, rightly or wrongly, even if there was a moral question about it, because the, whatever the means, the end is so fine. Yeah, I became an atheist from a Catholic upbringing. And... You know, you can be a Jewish atheist, you can be an Anglican atheist, I am a Catholic atheist. I have not d divorced myself of the, no uh, of the notion of guilt, Catholic guilt. So the thing I do when I gamble creates no good whatsoever. You know, I'm not a builder. I don't create, you know, things like this. I'm not an inventor. I don't create things that enable us to see and dark spaces. Essentially, all I do is redistribute wealth. I do no one any good except myself. The Catholic guilt, it might be, or it might just be my nature, means that any gain I have, I feel a little uncomfortable with. I run, run around with my chooky head cut off and unless I spend it. And so, but you're saying Mona, Mona is, is my... assuagement of your guilt? Say that again? It, that Mona is the, the, the way you assuage your guilt. Is that right? It certainly is. I've often wondered how to pronounce that word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've read it. It's A-S-S-U-A-G-E. -E. Beauty. You wrote a whole book. You're yeah, very literate. But I don't read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> how, you have... Um, I don't know how many... I'm sure many, many of you have been to Mona... Um, and one of the things that, that strikes you when you go is that it, David tends to be accompanied many times with 
a, a, a core, C-O-R-P-S, of women. And um, in fact, I think you've got, you, your curators, five or six of them are women. We don't even have five or six curators. But we have a few. And they're all women. No, 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 no. No, that's... I think uh, you, I, I was Olivia, just... Olivia could have been, you know, based... But he isn't uh, a woman. Uh, Jared, is Jared here? That's, that's... <laughs> Point proved. Yeah, could, you know... You do have a lot of females around we, we, you, though. I don't know. And I'm just, I'm, I'm interested that um, whenever I've seen you, You've had mainly women around you. In terms of, of your curators, your, your staff, why... I don't think that's true. That's not true? No. No? No, no, we... It's difficult to say, but... Yeah, I did, you know, it's probably 50-50 in the art component, but... And I wonder if it's a, an ex exhibition of bias. I, don't, I wonder if we're... But in the, you know, the flogging off stuff bit, the business component of Mona, there are a lot of men. Right. I think maybe it's just, I, I, was, I was noticing it in, in the art curation, just the actual artistic I, I would like to think that, you know, we employ at random on capacity, but let me tell you, within about the top 50 gambling minds we have, I think only about five of them are women, and the reason is because we just don't get job applications from women. It just, I suspect, I, I believe that there are differences in interests, differences in modalities, differences in the structure of brains of men and women. It is a legitimate hypothesis across any axis of interest, size, intelligence, speed, multitasking, that men and women are different. Just because something, well, to quote myself... <laughs> Why not? If only I could remember it. A proposition doesn't accrue merit in proportion to its desirability. We may, you know, we all, all be postmodernists that believe that the narrative creates reality. I'm not one of those people. I believe that men and women could be intellectually different, but we've done the experiment and they aren't, you know? An example I used in my book, if redback spiders evolved intelligence, their view of the male-female role would be that women and men are equal, except it's perfectly okay for the women to eat the men. You can't undermine your biology. I suspect, for example, that at least on one parameter, size, it's clear there's a different sexual dimorphism. Men are bigger than women. Robert Heinlein, a science fiction writer, is the only person I've ever heard contend that that isn't true. He said women tend to seek bigger partners and the really big women you just don't see. But I think that's probably crap. We can be different on a parameter that matters. Intelligence, the tests have been done. There is no difference. But there could have been, and it's a legitimate hypothesis. I guess that was... Back that... to employing people at Mona... The only because, you know, they're, they're fantastic women. That's all, that you surround yourself with, the ones I have well, met. But the men are shit. No, I haven't met the men. <laughs> I haven't met the men. I've met the women, and they're really impressive. And um, it's just really interesting to me that you have this extremely strong team who poke fun at you, who laugh with you, um, and clearly that's what you seek out. One of the great merits of being the fortunate risk-taker, the founder that got lucky is that you get to employ people that are generally, and also in particular in the domain of their expertise, much more able than you, much smarter than you, and that is... Initially, I resisted it, but 20 years ago, I realised that that's how you get things done, and it started... You know, it undermines... Initially, undermines your ego. It initially deflates what I think are the built-in biological modules, that when you give someone power and you then test their narcissism, the narcissism goes up. And incidentally, you know, if there's a more narcissistic human being today than Donald Trump, I don't know who he is, and it would be a male. But... Um, 
The reason it, it works for him is because across the psychology of status, there are three or four things that can enhance your status essentially by belittling others. The conspicuous consumption, conspicuous waste, conspicuous something else that I've forgotten, and conspicuous outrage that he clearly engages in. I suspect that he understands that because someone would have told him. There's a book called something that I don't recall. It was published in 1894 by a guy called Thorsten Veblen. Jane, what's the book called? C. <laughs> what's that? Oh, Theory of the Leisure Class. Now, yeah. So that uses biology. And, and in fact, so we invent uh, mass production and then it's really, really hard to show off conspicuous consumption. You can't just have, have the best outfit because they can be mass produced. Everyone's got a nice toy jacket. So what you do is you invent fashion. Fashion is a, about psychological status. It has a biological basis. And one of our scientists contend, this is Steven Pinker, he's pretty damn famous and might be our, our token big name, contends that art is not adaptive in itself. It's a side effect of an adaptation. And it's not clear in his, in his various writings, but I think he believes that this, the psychology of status is tied up very strongly in the creation of art, whether it's males or females creating art because of mutual mate choice. The fact is, art, at least elite art, and quite often folk art, establishes status. So he thinks that just like blood isn't adaptive, or the red colour of blood isn't adaptive of self, itself, as an example he gives, it is clearly the property of hemoglobin distributing oxygen that makes it red. A nicer example of side effect adaption Exaptation or spandrels, as it's called, is that feathers weren't invented for flight. Nature invented them in the sense that nature doesn't have goals, but the blind watchmaker created feathers for insulation, for warmth, and then they evolved into having another purpose, which is essentially, initially, an exaptation, a side effect of, of keeping warm. So... So Stephen Pinker believes that art is not an adaption. It's sort of piggybacking along on useful things like creating status. And I mean, just so, just so you'll um, be aware and be interested as, it up, as it's coming up, the, this show um, is going, called The Origin of Art, which will be four people, Pinker, Changizi, who's the um, person, person about the eyes and, and, and patterning, um, Brian Boyd, who is a... A literary professor and who talks about the role of narrative in, in binding. He's written books about evolutionary biology yep. as well. In society, and um, the other one is uh, Jeffrey Miller, Miller, who's the sexual selection uh, guy. Yes, exactly. And, and this, each of them will be going and selecting works from Mona, particularly. Um, no, well, not particularly, but it certainly makes it easier than borrowing stuff. The idea is to get a bunch of scientists to be curators to do the job of curators and select works that tell the tale of their own evolutionary theories. So they want to explain what, they don't want to, we're paying them to explain <laughs> what they believe about art using art. It's, there's no way it's scientific, but they're also writing papers and we'll publish a nice glossy book. But... We're down, far enough down the track that I can tell you it's going to be a bloody good exhibition, or four yeah. bloody good exhibitions. Possibly three bloody good exhibitions and one dud. And is this... But... <laughs> <laughs> and is this... Is this... Um, I mean, you're talking about the evolutionary nature of, 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 of humans. Is this one of the things humans do, that, that we, we 
keep sorting things and we keep putting things into orders and this is another explanation, that we want explanations. We keep, even for something like art, which really for a lot of the time, we're all quite happy if it's an abstract notion, but it's, it's, it's I think one of your creators, Elizabeth, talks about the train watchiness, quoting um, Germaine Greer, that we all want to order. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I think it's hard to describe yourself as fully human if you believe your own bullshit without question like Donald Trump. It's, it's great fun, but also not necessarily life-enhancing. It doesn't necessarily produce another generation. I'm not sure it's a biological adaption to look inside yourself, to be self-aware, to constant, like, while I'm sitting here, I believe, and I may be mistaken, that there's something sitting back there saying, is he making sense? Is he fidgeting too much? You know, does his dick look little in these pants? That sort of thing. I'm trying to maintain my status. For example, you know, if you do one of these and you do okay, you know, you got, you got lucky essentially, why do more? Let, there, there's an interesting question in that and I've tried to look into it. I'm thinking, why did I say yes to this? And in fact, essentially I didn't say yes to this because I agreed to do a talk and now I've done a conversation. I've copped out, right, big time. Because Your I choice. think because I think I can do that, and I'm not really very, I don't think I'm very good at a prepared speech. I don't think I read very well. I, I thought I might be able to maintain eye contact. I didn't realise that there'd be, you know, that my pupils would contract with the, the light, you know. So, yeah, I was scared shitless of being able to do this, but I lied to myself. I came up with some others. Nevertheless, I agreed to it. Why did I agree to it? A whole bunch of reasons. One is a cognitive bias called hyperbolic discounting. If it's a long way in the future, it's easy to say yes. So you don't go to, you don't go to someone and say, will you have dinner with me tomorrow night? Because they might say no, because they think you're a prick. You say, will we'll you have dinner with me sometime. Monday week in 2017? Uh, just and once. just to get rid of you, they'll say yes. And inevitable because they hyperbolically discount. A question about Mona. Uh, gambling is, for most of us, perceived as a pretty risky business. How secure is Mona? Um, it's pretty bloody secure. I've, in the press, told... I was... About to call it a fabrica fabrication, but that's like a euphemism for lie. I was about to, I've many times told the lie that I need a casino to perpetuate Mona. One of the, I said, my, I think my words were, I want to make, now I've become convinced that the audience cares about Mona. Initially when I opened it, I didn't give a shit if it outlasted me. Now I do care because... It has an audience, it has a bunch of people that call it our Mona. I mean, you used to say you didn't care if the river came up and drowned it. No, I was actually looking forward to that. But, and that was because I had to deal with heritage about the pre-existing buildings. So I thought it'd be nice to give someone else a problem. But anyway, yeah, so, now I care that people care, so I want it to survive me. I said I wanted to build a casino there, but essentially that's an art project. The casino, the idea of the casino was to perpetuate Mona in the event, as I put it, that I got hit by the proverbial bus. The transport minister in Hobart, his name is Reen Hitting, heard about this and he said, you needn't worry about that, not to me, but to Parliament or to some bloody formal event where everyone heard it. You needn't worry about that. I've had a word with our bus drivers. They're going to be very careful. <laughs> So, I'm, no, I'm just going to ask somebody in, but finish. Yeah, no, I'm not finished. So, sorry. I, sorry. Now you've distracted me. Oh. So, um, so I, I told the lie that Mona depended on me being provided with a casino license. I really want a casino license. I think it'd be a good thing for Mona. I think it'd be nice to demonstrate that there is a reality to. There's bad gambling and there's good gambling. Good gambling is ripping off rich people from a long way away that don't give a shit about a million dollars and spending it at Mona, right? On Mona, 
buying art or whatever. Bad gambling is poker machines that specifically target the poor. Good gambling is what you do when you're on a holiday. China and the US inadvertently hit on good gambling models by building Vegas and Macau gambling so that people go there for a holiday and they watch a show and they do whatever they do. They snort some coke and they shag someone they shouldn't shag and they lose a few bucks and they do it four days a year. It doesn't affect them in any financial way and they go home. It doesn't affect... It taxes their capital, not their income. That's good gambling. That's what I want to do. That's why I wanted my casino to only tax and therefore only admit people that travelled. Right. I don't need the casino. I'd like to have the casino. I think it'd be fun. I'll get by without it, you know? But the question was, is Mona Wolf financed by gambling? I talked before about statistical arbitrage. If you average enough events, you win. When you set up a business, our whole capitalist economy works because most of them fail, which means that in a competitive space, a few of them succeed. They're very good. Restaurants, the good restaurants are because they're surfing the crowd of bad restaurants. So, restaurants aren't a safe bet. Gambling is a very safe bet because there are so many trials. There are, look, it doesn't... Uh, she, they're waiting to talk to you. Yeah, well, I'm already bloody talking. So, <laughs> so, I don't know the exact number, but there are at least 100,000 horse races around the world. We win on about one in four, but when we win, we win enough usually to cover the other four. We lose most races, we win most days, we win most weeks, we win most months. It'd be very bloody hard for us to lose on a year, but if we did, it wouldn't matter because there's more than one year. Mona is financially secure unless there is a movement against gambling across the world, and if there is, I will be leading it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, firstly, I know how much you've Where done you? for Tasmania. Oh, right. <clears throat> yep. Uh, I know how much you've done for Tasmania, and it goes way beyond Mona. But I just wanted to ask you if two of your four guest curators chose the same art piece for their uh, exhibition, will there be a fight to the death <laughs> for uh, natural selection? <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that it has happened. Jane, like, I know Geoffrey chose some of the same pieces as uh, Brian. <laughs> yeah, so we wanted them actually not just to, to select the pieces that demonstrated their theory, but we also wanted to kick the other scientists, the other curators in the guts. So to pick work, the cho and the, at least one of them has taken that on in a big way. But um, yeah, the nature of science is about doubt. It's much easier to disprove something than prove something. So in answer to your question, I'd really like to see these guys having a brawl. <laughs> the, thank you. Unless you've got another question. Oh, it's a different guy, is it? Different guy, David. How are you? Can I ask you a question about mathematics? Uh, oh, I know who you are, you prick. How are Adam, you? Sp <laughs> it's Adam Spencer. And it's a privilege to ask you a question, you fuckwit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> mathematics is awesome. I think mathematicians will build this century. I do a bit of maths myself, and a lot of people talk to me about mathematics. And I read your book. Thank you. I'm reading yours. Including the words, not just the numbers. Oh, superb. <laughs> I like the pictures in yours, but this is, I'm loving it. <laughs> some, some people argue that you talk about difference in gender and height and mass and all that. Some people do say that at the elite level or at the very good level, boys are better than girls at maths. As the father of two young girls and someone who teaches maths, I personally disagree with that. What are your thoughts on 
but but what do you think about is there any natural gender ability or difference when it comes to handling deep mathematical concepts? First of all, talking, the answer is there almost certainly is. Most um, math results that are important that change the world happen to men when they're 25, the sort of guys that sit in the corners that have never got laid. It turns out, in my opinion, that I talked about mutual mate choice, but I also talked about the fact that, you know, men can splatter a billion sperm around while looking at a magazine. Women don't have so many eggs. And typically, and certainly in our ancestral environment, if not now, we're more invested in childcare, child rearing. So there is a discrepancy of investment, or there was when we evolved. Let's imagine that you want, that your genes want to get you to get your sperm into someone that gets them into the next generation, all right? There is a cutoff where you'd simply, this is the end for you, you produce no offspring, the end for your genes, I mean, you produce no offspring. So, the consequence of that is that once you're a failure, you might as well be a dismal failure. So you're better off going for broke, so to speak. In mathematics, as Adam will know, that's called a distribution. It turns out across most of the parameters that we can investigate, for example, general intelligence, the mean is the same, but the distribution is different. Men take more risks, and the publicly brightest men, the biggest loud mouths that also occasionally are right, are more likely to be men than women. So in other words, I'm literally saying that the smartest men are smarter than the smartest women. And the stupidest men are stupider than the stupidest women. But, sorry, can we also just That's make a distribution. Point the distribution. That the definition of smartness. So in answer to his question, the best mathematicians are men. And the worst mathematicians are men. But the, but because the, the distribution of smartness is wider. has been drawn up over centuries which have been dominated by men. It's a dangerous game, isn't it? It's a very dangerous It's very game. hard to sort out what is bullshit belief because men are more able, have, have a reason to, to take a risk and they're bigger and more able to do it and they're louder, whatever. When we accept that, we are accepting sexual dimorphism. We're accepting that there are differences. In the great apes that are most similar to us, most of them exhibit some of our behaviour. And when we investigate ancestral species, they do seem to exhibit sexual dimorphism. As I said before, it is a legitimate hypothesis that however you measure capacities, that men are different than women. It just turns out, not different, have different means. Yeah, I wasn't specific enough because I didn't know there'd be loud mouth mathematicians in the audience. But it turns out that the means are the same insofar as we've measured them. It takes more data to measure distributions. So most of the studies don't establish beyond reasonable doubt, whatever that means, beyond some statistically set arbitrary number of 1%, you know, 99% certainty or 99.9. But when you do a meta study of all the studies that have investigated these things, it really does look like, at least for some parameters, men are more willing to take risks. Biology as an expression through men is more willing to take risks. And I don't mean this in a teleological way. There's no future being decided by biology. It's just that the ones that didn't get propagated into the future now don't exist. The genes that are, that are expressed that didn't get, uh, didn't get us laid in our ancestral population are not now getting to dictate their policy. Dead. Why the distribution? I just want to say many, many things. But one of them... <laughs> I know. I know. But one of them is... At best guess, we invented, we being, you know, me and God, sex 1.2 billion years ago. And there must have been at least 700 million and possibly more than a billion generations of our ancestors between then and now 
all of whom got laid every time. 700 million times in a row, plus times all the number of answers that you had, all of you were sexual winners. It's easy to see when you think about it like that, that it selects for particular characteristics because it's massively unlikely. The, priv the huge privilege we possess is the fact that against all this statistical unlikelihood, we were born. It is a huge privilege to have had the good fortune to be born. That's why I sort of think, you know, worrying about death's a little bit strange because death, the probability is one. Birth, the probability is infinitesimal. I got lucky uh, and therefore why should I worry, why should it concern me that the prob my probability of being alive will one day fall by one? You know something, David? <laughs> I feel we have just had a glimpse inside your head and it's a very busy place. An extremely busy set. I'd, I'd like to ask you one question, just like, and if you could give me a yes, no. <laughs> if you couldn't, do you no. always... No. <laughs> no, I can't give you a yes, no. Try. Yes, do I'll answer you, the question. We have, must wait soon. Do you always assemble all the information and reach the conclusion, or do you sometimes go to the conclusion and work backwards? I'm a completely biased machine like everyone else. Because I've been thinking about it, I know that. But yeah, I'm, I'm under the delusion that I know what I'm talking about. It's a, just stringing a sentence together is an incredible biological phenomenon. You got, you know, 10 billion neurons, each of which is voting on my, on my next word. <laughs> how, how weird is that? How can I construct, I'm essentially conducting an election with a lot of electors that have one issue voters that's right. To prepare a thought, and yet I can come to the end of a sentence and occasionally have it end cogently. <laughs> and I think... <laughs> and it's a very fine machine. All I can say is I, I imagine I'm... you feel the same, is that um, we are all waiting for the astronomical exhibition, which will come after yeah. this one, and I hope you'll be back to discuss that. But in the meantime, um, I'd like to... I might to get like Adam to curate a <laughs> mass exhibition one day. I'd like to say I've been... I was, I was in Mona, um, down in Tasmania recently, and I was talking to some of the people, and, and the, the first questioner who talked about David has done a lot for Hobart, for Tasmania, for Australia, which, which is not just Mona, and it's true. Um, and someone was talking about David's bid to whether or not he'd be able to get a casino built. Um, Monaco, I think you wanted to call it. Um, and that's a different story, for, but, but um, and, you know, the classic taxi driver said to me, anything David Walsh wants in this city, David Walsh will get. And it wasn't because of power, it was because... Um, there is such gratitude and appreciation for what he has done with Mona. So what was that? So he has, he has done a splendid thing. And I think he has given a splendid version of himself that the, the exhibition will be called The Origin of Art. I imagine that you will be there to explain personally and in depth the various exhibitions, the, the various displays. Is that right, David? You'd be surprised how little I know. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to ask mm -hmm. Jane and her mates. But what? She's so bright, she got a free ticket. <laughs> for all those who either paid for or got free tickets for whatever reason who came here tonight to listen to David Walsh, won't you please thank him?